during her MBBS, MD, and DGO tenure. She's the director and founder of Srishti, India's first and only registered patient support group for infertile couples. She's the recipient of several awards such as Mahila Gaura Puraskar, Woman of the Year, Rashtriya Ekta Award, Award of Excellence in Medical Innovation, Award of Excellence by Harvard Medical School, Netaji Subhashandra Special Appreciation Gold Medal for outstanding work in the field of infertility, and the Indian Achievers Award for Health Excellence. Uh, Madam will be talking on the surgical risks associated with egg removal during IVF ICSI and egg donation. Good afternoon, and it's wonderful to be here. While most of the people come to Goa to enjoy themselves, this room, the, st the people here, the colleagues here who are coming, are coming to listen to academics. Can you imagine? Hats off to all of you. And I think it's only Gautam, Goral, and Sulba who can do this, of bringing all of us to Goa to sit and listen to academics. Thanks so much for the invite. I, I do hope uh, I will frighten you as much as I was frightened at the end of preparing this talk. We know the transvaginal retrieval of oocytes in IVF is easy to learn and perform, high rate of retrieval, it's an office procedure, has replaced laparoscopic oocyte retrieval, but like everything that is easy, particularly there are complications, though rare. And all these complications are created uh, by us. It's iatrogenic and due to the damage of the needle that is used for retrieval. Because of its simplicity and effectiveness, it has gained worldwide popularity and now become a gold standard in the treatment. But unfortunately, very little systemic data is available on its complications. The complications of the treatment have been neglected so far and because there's no direct link with the cycle outcome and centers do not report them very easily because of less compliance. The complications can occur within a few days to a few weeks and the discipline of reporting them does not exist in many of us. So here I am speaking to you on the surgical risks associated with oocyte retrieval during ART procedures. The first question that comes to us is how big is the problem? And the answer, we don't know. When I looked into the PubMed search and I typed in IVF, I had 17,149 references. ICSI, 6,000 and odd. But when I put complications of oocyte retrieval, there were only 308 complications that were recorded. Unfortunately, there are a few large studies on complications of oocyte retrieval, and most of them are retrospective. Most of the publications are only case reports. Many centers do not report complications, particularly the minor ones. We know that in the last 15 years, the complications are much less than they used to be when there was laparoscopic retrieval. These complications have reduced mainly because of the method and the route of egg retrieval, shift from laparoscopy to transabdominal, from transvercycle to uh, transvaginal. The rates have definitely of the complications come down, however. When you try to put the complications together, number one is the complication of anesthesia and sedation, which is used, very rare. Infection, about one to five per thousand. Pain, three per hundred, hemorrhage, mild hemorrhage, three per hundred, and severe hemorrhage, about one per thousand or more. Damage to pelvic structures, one per thousand. Adnexal torsion, less than one per thousand. But what did we learn? Three out of hundred otherwise normal, healthy women undergoing oocyte retrieval become hospitalized ill patients. Can you imagine? So let's try to find the answers to the what, why, whom, where, 
complications of oocyte retrieval. Let's go to anesthesia first. 94% of the pickups are done under general anesthesia or deep sedation. It's a very safe procedure except drug-related adverse reactions, and it's about 1 in 10,000. There is no literature on the complications, and it is similar to that of any other elective surgery. There is only one case report of conduction defects, severe bradycardia and uh, bradypnea, 85 minutes after installation of mepivaricin for vaginal oocyte recovery. So what should be practiced to avoid complications in anesthesia? Number one, check all systems before the patient is prepared for the oocyte retrieval. Complete the aspiration process expeditiously and all agents should be used for the shortest possible time with the smallest possible dose. Bleeding. Of course, this is a very important complication that we should know, so let's look at the how, why, what, and when of bleeding. The first question that needs to be answered is, what is normal blood loss in an oocyte pickup? When you look, in date, look through data, it is about 200 to 230 ml at the end of 24 hours is acceptable. When does bleeding occur? It may occur immediately after the procedure. It may, occur two, it may be obvious two hours later, sometimes a few days to a few weeks as well. The next question is bleeding from where? Most of the time it's the vaginal wall and you can control the bleeding with a little pressure or probably at the most a stitch. But sometimes you may have peri-ovarian hematomas, hem hemoperitoneum, bleeding during irrigation today morning, a lot of talk was on the diameter of the needle and bleeding occurring during aspiration of the follicles and irrigation as well. And of course, corpus luteal hemorrhage is known to have bleeding. The next question that needs to be answered is, who are the patients who would have this sort of bleeding? Number one, it may be due to direct injury to the uterus, the bladder, the colon, the pelvic blood vessels, which are misinterpreted as follicles. The other is medical complications like a deficiency of factor IX, essential thrombocytopenia, and patients undergoing prophylactic anticoagulant therapy and ovarian necrotizing vasculitis. There is only one report on this. How does one diagnose this? Abdominal pain and hemodynamic instability are the first signs and symptoms. And of course, when you do an ultrasound, there's more than 20, 200 ml of blood. This you can see on ultrasound. And you can confirm by a laparoscopic procedure thereafter. What next? When you suspect that the patient has a bleeding, you observe, and most of the time it stops. Like they say, all bleeding ultimately will stop. But then sometimes you require laparoscopy or laparotomy to control the bleeding. But the most important uh, point that I learned over time is pray. If you look at the incidence of vaginal bleeding, it ranges from 0.09 to 2.9%. And the latest review says 0.34%. Intraperitoneal bleeding is seen in 0.3% of the patients, according to this data. But did you know that there is a very good correlation between BMI and polycystic ovaries and bleeding? Six out of seven were discussed as a tear. So when you have more follicles, you have more bleeding, and you have to be careful about it. So what's the remedy? When you're doing a pickup, see that the probe is very well applied to the vaginal wall and to the um, ovaries as you're picking them up. Enter straight, and when you're pulling back the needle, put the probe in the original point where you have inserted it, and then pull it out straight away. Otherwise, you could clear, make tears in the ovary. And of course, the most important point is don't overstimulate. Softer stimulations are very important. The two case reports of hemorrhage were one from a natural cycle OPU and the other from a long protocol, and both of them had more than 600 ml of blood, and 
the bleeding was controlled by laparoscopic coagulation of the bleeding points. There's also a case report of massive intraperitoneal bleed. And this, the patient only, her only symptoms were severe abdominal pain and tenesmus. Two hours later, there was increasing pain and hemodynamic instability. A massive retroperitoneal hematoma was drained, complicated by infection. So you can see what appears to be a very simple procedure is not particularly so. There's another report from uh, Jay Krishnan in India, and he reported massive hematuria starting seven days after the oocyte pickup. And this was following the presence of um, um, a huge um, pseudoaneurysm of the bladder. So you have to be careful when a patient reports to you with hematuria post pickup, not only of injury to the bladder, but also situations like this that may surface at the end of the procedure. Injury to the pelvic structures. There are several case reports, particularly injury to the ureter, and there are two case reports of a perforated appendix. Can you imagine? You can go that far as well. Injury to the bowel, it's more a theoretical possibility because when you're doing a pickup, you can see bowel very clearly. Probably we are injuring bowel, but it sort of repairs itself spontaneously and resolves, so it's not very obvious. But of course, as I mentioned earlier, there are two reports in literature of a perforated appendix, multiple punctures on the appendix as well. Injury to the ureter, it is surprising that we see less of this. Uh, given the anatomical position, we know that the position of the ureter is anterolateral to the upper phonics in the vagina, and it's surprising that we don't injure so many of them as well. And the suggestion is, always move a cul-de-sac ovary laterally and away from the ureter and be aware that injury to the ureter can occur at all times. The case report, of, there are three to four case reports of ureteric injury, one case report of a uroperitoneum and it was only the uh, delayed helical CT that showed marked leakage of the um, contrast into the right pelvic ureteric junction and a cystoscopy was done with the stenting which was removed 10 weeks later and the patient had marked relief of pain. There are other reports, case reports of urethrovaginal fistula secondary to oocyte retrieval. It sounds so frightening, but it's true. When you look at pelvic infection, the risk factors we know are pelvic inflammatory disease, endometriosis and the presence of adhesions and the range of uh, complications are from 0% to 1.3. We've had speakers speak about this in the morning as well. What are the pathways of infection? Very obvious. It may be direct inoculation of the vaginal microorganisms by the puncture of a non-sterile vagina. Reactivation of latent chronic infection, particularly with patients with pelvic inflammatory disease and reinfection of puncture of chronically infected ovaries. And we have our patients in India with a very high incidence of tuberculosis, so we have to be careful about this. Puncture of hydrosalpings and pyosalpings. And most important, if you can see this particular picture here, we had done a laparoscopy for this patient, and what we saw here was the rectum that was adherent all along the pouch of Douglas here. So these are the patients you have to be very cautious. Just imagine doing a egg pickup for this patient. You have to be careful because trauma to the bowel, though least likely, can result in a pelvic abscess. Who are the patients who are prone? Patients with a history of pelvic infection following a hysterosalpingogram or laparoscopy and hysteroscopy are the most prone. Those with ovarian endometrioma, we know that the endometrioma is a good culture medium for infection. A presence of a dermoid cyst itself inadvertently aspirated because of poor resolution of your ultrasound equipment. And we consider a dermoid for a reason for not accepting a donor in our institute. We know that whenever we see an endometrioma, the first thing is do we uh, excise the endometrioma or leave it alone? We also know that endometrioma has a high risk of pelvic abscess and we have to be cautious. Though we try to avoid endometriomas in the line when we are doing our egg pickup, many a time we still inadvertently puncture these and we have to be careful of giving them a good antibiotic post pickup. How to prevent them? Minimize the number of needle punctures, 
prophylactic antibiotic, particularly in the high risk cases, disinfection and thorough washing of the vagina and a recent uh, pr uh, article by Mel David Meldrum, he mentioned that betadine vaginal prep for all high risk patients, particularly those with endometrioma and a hydrosalpinx and pelvic inflammatory disease in the past. Remove and separate hydrosalpinges before IVF is another method. Coming to the next, pain after oocyte retrieval. Most patients tolerate pain. They are pains in our backsides when they are going, undergoing treatment, but they tolerate pain very well. The pain increases with the number of oocytes that are retrieved, and most of the patients, 60% of the patients by the day of embryo transfer have no more pain. And there are about 0.7% of the patients who will still get admitted into emergency for severe abdominal pain, which is not related to OHSS. These are the different pain scores. And we know that more than 10 oocytes, the pain score is much more. And so the answer is that more trauma to the ovary, more pain. So be softer on your stimulation. Another reason. So what are the lessons learned? Go softer on your stimulation and the issue of pain is always neglected and there's no data available in literature. An exaltation is considered in every patient undergoing egg pickup, particularly those patients who complain of abdominal pain and nausea during the course of stimulation. The rarer complications, case studies of vertebral osteomyelitis in a 41-year-old with unexplained infertility, low back pain immediately after egg pickup, one week later, she has fever and low back pain diagnosed as vertebral osteomyelitis. Caution, when you're trying to do a pickup, try to push the ovary down and with abdominal pressure, probably use a tenaculum and then abdominal pressure so that you can bring the ovary down and don't chase the ovary with your needle. Guide, with your needle. Neurological complications, there is one reported case of a hypodense lesion following egg pickup in the obturator space above the lumbosacral plexus manifested with severe pain in the lower limb. She recovered completely. Another case report, which I thought was interesting, a 38-year-old 30 38 male factor infertility, grade three endometriosis, 10 days after ovarian um, oocyte pickup, lands up with a tubo ovarian abscess. Laparotomy was done, hospitalized for two weeks. Very common scenario, but the next question, she's returned for ICSI again. The answers to these, the questions to this audience is, would you only take prophylaxis considering you've done it before also? What is her risk of having a tubo ovarian abscess again? Would you like to perform another cycle considering you're not paid to take risks? How do I conclude? I conclude by saying keep the ovary close to the transducer at all times. Firm pressure on the probe, abdominal pressure is the answer. Avoid bleeding, uh, avoid bending the needle by rotating it. And to look at the bivel, you can just move it a bit, then see the bivel and see where you are at all times during an egg pickup. Endometriomas, vaginal prep with betadine, and post pickup broad spectrum co coverage and avoid entering cysts you don't know anything about. The complications we know are rare, but they do occur. We should be aware of them. And the aim is accurate diagnosis and prompt investigation. But like Murphy's Law says, if we per perceive that there are four possible ways of going wrong and circumvent this, the fifth one unprepared for will promptly develop. Oocyte pickup is simple, safe, with a few complications. However, all complications should be, all precautions should be taken to prevent these complications, including the minor and the late ones. But as the Murphy's Law says, if everything seems to be going well, you have obviously overlooked something else. How else do I end my statement? We are dealing with a healthy population undergoing op optional surgical procedures and get great care should be taken to inform your patients in detail because the lesson learned is anything that can go wrong will. I was absolutely frightened by this on mail online 
And this was an Indian woman who died following an egg pickup. And if you look at the statement made by her husband, if the hospital had told me there was even a 1% chance that Nina would die, I would have said no. We are not doing this. We had discussed our desire for a family from the moment we married in 2002 and agreed that she came first, not the baby. We were told every, during every stage that this is a routine procedure, that even when things went wrong, she, she was in so much pain, the doctor said, it's a minor complication. I, they never suggested that she would die. Lesson learned, patients should be aware of the risk of oocyte retrieval. Physicians should give them correct information on the incidence of these complications. It should be reported on a written format that the woman and her husband should sign before undergoing the procedure. Serious intraperitoneal hemorrhage is known, but great care should be taken to prevent it. If there are two or more ways to do something wrong, and one of the ways would result in catastrophe, somebody would do it. And this is my last slide. I have learned that what the mind doesn't know, the eyes will not see. But when the eyes see, life is safer and easier. Patients will now be safe in all your hands because you're aware of the possible complications of oocyte pickup. I know I was petrified at the end of this, but I just told myself, maybe I'm more aware, more frightened, more careful, and probably thank you again, Gotham, for giving me this horrible lecture. <laughs>